I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Materialism Podcast of the new year, 2022. Andrew, how you doing, man? Oh, good. <laughs> I feel like just barely scraped by last year and now. It's going to be an exciting year, but it's going to be a lot of work. It is. Um, you graduate this year. Hopefully. Very exciting. Very excited for you. Yep, it was fantastic. You have a nice break? Yeah, it was pretty good. Got to go up to Idaho and enjoy some of the powder up there. It oh, was a uh, knee deep powder on the mountain. So good. I guess everyone else probably is aware, but the West has gotten just nuked with snow. It has been so phenomenal. I've been taking my kids up skiing. It's been really great. Yeah. One of the best winters in a while, but it's cold. Oh, it was yeah. like negative 20 at the summit. Oh man. You know, it's that bad when you go to sniff and your nose, <laughs> your nostrils just stick together. Like, Oh gosh. Yeah. Very I cold. thought the, uh, the beard would help out this year, but no. It's a no. liability, man. It collects frost. <laughs> yeah, it actually got worse. Yeah. Well, I'm psyched about today's episode, and I am particularly psyched because it's one that I've wanted to do for a while, but the time wasn't right, right? The time became right this year when I went to the grocery store, and I'm buying my avocados, and you've bought avocados. It's a pain in the butt. You don't know if they're ripe, and they go bad so fast. It's this whole rigmarole, but then this time, I see a little sticker on it that says, Appeal. And I know this company because I started grad school with the founders of this company. They were right in my starting class of grad school. Um, And I was so excited. It finally went from an idea out of their head to a product in my grocery store. Andrew, what do you know about rotten fruit? Oh, lots. I mean, as (laughs) a, uh, as soon as I left my parents' house and I had to actually buy food for myself, I quickly discovered the, uh, the challenge of trying to buy food so that it's just ripe when you need the most. But I feel like avocados especially are a, big challenge because there's a window (laughs) you get them when they're kind of green and kind of hard and then it's kind of this like internal calculation of is this going to be ready for when i want to eat it totally and then you get caught up with something and you forget about it and then it's too late it's the worst poor shelf life of produce you know not just fruit but all sorts of foods is a huge problem right all around the world we would love to uh, feed more people be more efficient with our farming manage the nitrogen cycle better but part of that is going to be preventing food from spoiling And that's why we have today's guest, Lou Perez, who is the VP of Technology at Appeal Sciences. Lou, we're so excited to have you here. Want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yep. Uh, You got the name down, so all good there. But uh, yeah, Lou Perez, um, uh, yeah, uh, VP of Tech, head of the technology team here at Appeal Sciences. I've been here since the get-go and part of the founding team. Um, Really started kicking things off the end of 2013. Um, And yeah, I basically oversee all the all the fun stuff, all the fun nerd stuff, you know, ranging from our formulation development, so R and D work to engineering, um, our software, data science groups. Um, so yeah, get to basically work with yeah, some of the smartest people every day. So cool. So tell us a little bit about Appeal Sciences in a nutshell. What is it that you guys do? So yeah, Appeal Sciences, uh, we uh, we have developed a edible um, plant-based coating that you put on the um, on the surface of fresh produce that extends the shelf life um, could be up you know 2x and past that um, and what's nice about it is that it works without refrigeration and it's all plant-based um, yeah it's yeah that's what we yeah. so so coatings <laughs> right i i coatings, know that yeah. like when I go to the, the, the grocery store, first off, I saw your product at my store and I was out of my mind oh, excited great. for you. Just so excited. Cool. Uh, for those listeners yeah. who don't know, uh, Lou and I started grad school together along with James, the other founder of the company. And so it's so cool to see you guys go from graduate students to now having this company that is impacting my life, right? It's on the things that I buy. It's just too cool. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, fruit already sort of has a coating, right? They'll dip it in wax or I don't know what they do to it. They do things like that. This is different mm-hmm. than you do. How so? Yeah, so that's actually kind of nexus of the idea itself. So fruit, tip, fruit or most uh, uh, land-dwelling plants have some type of protective coating on it that um, actually evolutionary-wise, that's what allowed plants to come onto land, is that what this coating did was prevent desiccation or water loss. Um, and so what we did was 
you know, when we first thought about this idea or heard about this problem about food waste, where, you know, 30 to 50% of food goes, you know, gets wasted, gets lost, tossed wow. away, what have you. Yeah. So incredible number and just a number of different down stream effects from that. And so many inputs that go into the, our food today, it, it, you know, to the food system, it's, it's, it's incredible. And so here in these numbers, uh, you know, material scientists, we thought, okay, well, okay, what is the mode of action or why does fruit spoil in the first place, right? There's this is a biotic way, which is, you know, fungus, mold, what have you. Um, but there's also abiotic stressors, which is uh, water loss, the desiccation, and um, oxidation as well. Do those so the spoil idea was, food or they just make them taste bad because it's like tough or whatever? Mm -hmm. Like it, it does both, yeah. So essentially when you have too much water loss, the, the like most produce is, you know, a high percentage water. So once you start to lose water, you know, think of even materials, again, like structurally, you really start to lose the, yeah, the structural integrity of that piece of produce. And uh, I guess strawberries are a really good example where as they start to shrink, you know, crevices form, cracks happen, and then now, you know, now it's a breeding ground for any type of mold or you know, fungus, what have you. So. Gotcha. Yeah, so the net, that's typically most of the quality aspects too are really due to the fact that it's able to retain this moisture um, and able to maintain that you know the the nutrients and all the other um, flavor compounds inside of it. So it's you know it's really what holds it together structurally, but then also gives it a lot of the um, um, you know the attractive features of of a piece of produce, particularly fruit. So is is the ability to maintain the water, and so that's what we so look right up on this and said okay well. Well, nature does this already somehow. How does how, how did this happen in the first place? And that's when we uh, dug a little deeper and um, looked into, you know, like a, any material scientist would do. You know, it's like, okay, is this some type of, what's, what's the materials of construction? Um, what's the mode of action? How does this work? And, um, yeah, just really dug deep on it. Like, you know, there's a, like I said, in every land well and plant, there's like a, a basically a cuticular layer that has like a mixture of waxes and a number of other things. And so... We said, okay, let's analyze that and figure out if there's a material set or material system from that, that then we could then basically bolster already what the plant or piece of fruit, what have you already has. So give it an additional peel. That's a little bit where the name of the company comes from, right? Yeah, yeah. Sort of a second yeah. peel that you can put on it. That's yeah, very cool. Yeah, second peel, right, yeah. No. So it's like we analyze, for example, like you look at a lemon, you, know, you look at a strawberry, they both have the same sort of outer coat and it's just one might have a slightly different composition of it or a slightly different amount. And that really is what's given um, the longevity of the produce. Is there is is this is this type of coating? Can you go into a little bit about what comprises that coating and why they're different across different fruits? Yeah, mainly. Um, so what we keyed in on are these like glycerolipids, um, and as the kind of build and block material for for the coatings. And um, you know, every single different piece of produce will have a different sort of composition profile. These glycerolipids are like the, the the length of the chain, the you know even the chemistry, double bonds, multi bonds, things like that. And so um, there is a general um, like theme or materials theme, I guess for for for, for the coding composition wise. but um, yeah, that's where that's where a lot of the R and d came in, okay, is which 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 compounds then this is this is the really cool part, the real material science part, right? It's like, what mixture of compounds or composition do we use and to get this structure, this, you know, kind of microstructure, right. That then gives these properties of um, reducing transpiration, oxidation, and then ultimately performance. So it's just really classical. Um, and then for us, you know, look into, look into nature as inspiration for this idea of what the coding could be or should be um, was really important. Cause I think, I think any material scientist just kind of objectively given this problem might say, well, I could probably come up with 10 or 15 kind of material yeah. systems that might do this. Um, at least, you know, on a small scale level, I can show that if I take this piece of fruit and I dip it in whatever molten polyethylene, I mean, probably too warm <laughs> actually, but you know what I mean? They can, they can do that. And yeah, now I have a coding on it that you know, maybe you can consume maybe you shouldn't, but um, we'll definitely extend the shelf life. But we really wanted, knowing that it was food, that you know, something people consume, we really had this design constraint that we wanted to make sure that it was inspired by nature and things that people already eat, stuff that already comes from plants. Yeah. So, so do people wash this off? Like, how's it work? Or do you eat it and not taste it? Is it super thin that you don't really notice it? Does it impact yeah, the taste of the texture? It's, 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 it's like sub micron level. Yeah. So definitely you, you can't see it. It has, you, you can't taste it. Um, 
it's food already. So no reason to wash it off. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's really Im imperceptible in a way. So that was the other thing as well. It's like, how can you, um, you know, put a, this type of coating on that will have, um, full coverage, you know, give you that type of performance. Um, and yeah, it doesn't affect the taste or the, you know, what, what the consumer really wants from the, you know, from the piece of produce itself. That's right. Is this applied at the store per, uh, by the vendor? Like at what point does this get sort of applied? Right. So the cool thing it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's basically a white powder <laughs> and then from there you dissolve it in, in water. And so you can really apply it all different stages. Meaning I can give you a squirt bottle and you could have it in your house and you could be spraying this on the produce you buy. Um, what we currently do though, is because of economies of scale, we typically do our applications at what are known as supply, well, packing houses. Um, so t just take one step back. How the, this is the cool part of the job. <laughs> one of the cool parts is really learning the food system, right? So uh, in most cases you have farmers or growers, you know, they grow, uh, you know, lemons, strawberries, what have you. And then what they do is they then sell their crop to a supplier or a packing house um, where then all the, all of it goes, it basically everything gets funneled there. And in the packing house, that's where they wash it, they clean it, they package it. They get that ready then to sell to a retailer. And then the retailer then sells to you. So where we typically do our application is at the supply, um, you know, the packing house, the supplier of the packing house, because like I said, most of the, most of the produce is funneled there anyway. So economy is a scale and uh, just efficiency um that that's usually where it gets applied so gets applied at the place right before it gets to the retailer gotcha now they probably mm -hmm. i'm sure they have techniques i remember reading an article once it's like how long has that apple been you know bumbling around and shipping cards before it got to you and it was like shocking right. it was it was many many months so they right. must have techniques already not just picking it green but also packing it in i don't know different gas atmospheres um does mm -hmm. this synergize with that does this replace that will this change that scenario at all yeah, fortunately, it, it, it synergizes with it. It's, you know, meaning it, it can work in concert with those other technologies. And, you know, for example, it's funny how where we're at as a society, but like, I think people like we, we lose sight that, you know, refrigeration is a technology, right? It just it's become so commonplace that it's just assumed we you, you have that. Um, so yeah, with those other technologies, be refrigeration or these, um, you know, gaseous atmospheres that, you know, you know, we, we've shown that we can work in concert with it, um, or replace it if, if, if necessary, if that's, if that's what somebody wants. So that's red. Now you said that this coating's about, or oh, sub micron, uh, even mm -hmm. materials that are insoluble in water, right? You're still going to have some sort of diffusion. So what do your water loss rates look like with the coating on there? In addition to oxygen yeah. permeability, I guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. So like how we typically, that's a really good question. So how we typically compare the coatings, we'll take a control set, say we say we take apples, for example, you know, we'll take 20 apples, we'll take 10, we'll just leave them alone, keep them like untreated, just let them be. We'll take the uh, other 10 apples and we'll, we'll coat them some way, like we'll do the application. Um, and then from there, we'll compare weight loss over time, uh, be it through, you know, just using a balance and measuring. So we get a sense of most of the mass loss that you would see over time is going to come from water, you know, from evaporation. So that's a, that's a very simple way to, to do that kind of comparison is how much more water is retained. And so that's where in the case, um, it, it correlates pretty well to the actual shelf life extension in days, but the, the amount of water that you're, you, that you preserve. And so that can be, like I said, it could be up to, we might have the rate at which water diffuses from an, uh, uh, an appeal treated avocado or, or apple avocado, what have you versus untreated, um, will be, is like, uh, it's like half, you know, half or more basically. So That's phenomenal. Yeah. So we do a lot of like the time lapse. Maybe you guys have seen it. This was one of the cool things yeah. we did starting out was the time lapse photography. And at first, that was really supposed to be um, uh, an R and D tool, right? So I mean, you, you guys are scientists, you know, experimentalists, and you know the, the it takes. You want to try to have things be as consistent as possible and um, try to automate things as much as possible. So the idea was to actually use that where we'll take an image every thirty minutes and then we'll culminate it into a video and didn't do analysis in that video. So we can look at the rate at which it shrinks and correlate that to a, to a mass loss or the, how color changes and correlate that to, you know, how long this is preserving the quality um, 
of, of the particular piece of produce. Um, is that a technology yeah. you guys ended up Because I remember talking to you. It was either you or James about this five or six years ago. And yeah. you were like, hey, is there a way to do this with ML or do we have to do this by hand? And I was kind of curious, whatever became of that, do you still, is it still a tool you use? And if so, is a person actually looking at that or do you have software? Yeah, so, yeah, we have, yeah, we, we definitely, it's advanced pretty far. I would say the idea originally came up, I think it was when kind of when we were in the grad school time, that's like when the planet Earths and all that stuff started coming out. And you saw the cool, like, yeah. um, like time lapse photography yeah. of like seeing a tr- like a seed grow to a tree, you know? Um, I think that kind of was a little bit of the inspiration for that. Like, how do we monitor time without, you know, f- and then physically having to go there, move something every day, take calipers and all those other things. Um, and yeah, so now it's, this is actually the next stage of where we're at as a company. So we've developed this edible coding, right. That helps prolong the shelf life for fresh produce. But some of our biggest initiatives now are towards what, like the ML, the data science, um, and, and model building in a sense to automate quality, um, measurements and prediction, right? Because that was one of the probably most, one of the more surprising things when we first started to do this, right? So first we went at it with a very sort of material science, chemical uh, chemistry perspective, which yeah. is let's get it, let's find a, a material system, um, let's test it and, and you know, just iterate from there. But how do you test it? You know, like there's no, <laughs> there's no real objective test that didn't tell you like this piece of fruit is better than another piece of fruit, right? So we really had to come up with all of our testing methods, which, um, you know, some are out there in literature, but you, you know, in most cases you can't, we had to build the equipment, yeah, we had to come up with the built. methods, we had to write the software. And then now it's like building and, and, and making the predict prediction models as well. So, yeah. I think you mentioned that different fruits have different coatings that they have developed and evolved to have. Do you use, apply the same composition of your uh, appeal to every single fruit or do you vary it to make it more compatible with uh, different fruits? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, yeah, this is what that's like most of the investors ask us. It's like that, that kind of question. Um, so in, in, in most cases, yeah, we can pretty quickly get on the dartboard with our, with our call it like, um, standard formulation, but as far as an opt, there's a lot of an optimization work that we'll do based on the topology of the piece of fruit, based on the, you know, the hydrophobicity of the surface, right? So we're trying to apply an aqueous formulation and some fruit already has a natural like wax layer on it. So, you know, uh, wax is being particularly uh, hydrophobic. So then we have to come up with creative ways to then ensure we have a, uh, you know, continuous or contiguous coating around each piece of fruit. So, yeah. So, so yeah, each piece of fruit will take, will have a little bit of its um, alterations in, in regards to the formulation and, and maybe the process in, of the formulation or yeah, it's very, again, very, very material science. So it's not just composition. It's how you then make that formulation in a way, right. That then will control its final properties. So speaking of material science, I can't remember what you did for graduate research. Was it similar to this or was this like a totally different field after you graduated that you sort of moved into? Yeah, the field was totally Steel field was definitely totally different. Um, but as far as in grad school and, and throughout undergrad, um, um, yeah, I studied thin film, basically, basically, yeah, thin fi- like organic thin films, you know, okay. so really took a lot of those principles and applied it to them this new area. In particular, in grad school, I was looking at um, organic electronics, um, thin film organic electronics and doing um, synthesis and also structural characterization work. Okay. Um, yeah, with the Ed Kramer and, uh, and Guy Bazan at UCSB. Okay. So most people, yeah, and you know this, but starting companies is hard <laughs> and typically very unsuccessful. Yeah. Was this your first shot right out of grad school? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so, and it's sort of the best time, I think, to really do that kind of stuff. You don't really know better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's actually kind of cool because every time we hire a new employee and they're coming out of their PhD, I can actually, you can tell, like they just have this yeah. sort of like, almost grit to them, you know, it's kind of like hustle. Um, and so, yeah, it was right at the end of uh, grad school when, you know, finished up the thesis and then, and then jumped straight to straight to doing this right away. And it was, um, it was James, you mentioned before, yeah, he was, you know, in part of our cohort at UCSB and then, uh, another co-founder Jenny Dew, and she was actually a postdoc in our research lab in, in the Bazan lab. And so, yeah, it just got started so yeah, from the get-go and yeah, just started, started. Well, yeah. one for one, and now you've got a very successful company. I mean, you, you yeah. got to feel like you missed out on like the the struggle bus. You just w- yeah, were successful no, right out no, the gate, no. man. No, well, tell no. me about. I remember hearing early on that you guys got funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. How'd that mm-hmm. come about? How impactful was that for you guys? 
Yeah. So, you know, we had won the new venture competition at UCSB. It's an annual um, sort of like a pitch fest. Um, and, and at that point, what did um, you have? Did you just like have a really early preliminary? It was just, just an idea. Just an idea. Yeah. Wow. Just an idea. Cause we were deep in our, you know, PhD work and um, pretty dedicated, you know, students, <laughs> researchers or whatever. So it was really just the idea. Um, and yeah, so went and pitched that idea. And of course you, you put together all the, you know, the material is a total addressable market, you know, uh, competitors, what's out there. And you know, fortunately put together a pretty strong package and won the new venture competition. And then the Bill and Wendy Gates, we applied, they had, they had, they had their grand challenges. Um, um, they, they released that, I believe every several months. And one of them was about um, in sub-Saharan Africa, cassava is a, is a, or yucca, there's a couple ways, a couple of names for that. Um, I grew up calling it yucca, but it's cassava is thing more global. And um, they wanted to find different ways in sub-Saharan Africa how to preserve cassava so they can get it to market because it's a crop that can, it, it's a, it grows underground. It needs very little inputs. And, but the shelf life is terrible. It's like a, once you cut it, it's like a day or two and then you're done. And so that's, that's why in most cases it's just turned into some type of flower. And so we, they had caught a call out for this and we're like, okay, well, how do we, this idea of appeal, how do we apply that to, to, um, cassava in sub-Saharan Africa to, to prolong the, to help pr- uh, prolong the shelf life. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, we got a long way to go and I wouldn't say one for one. We got, <laughs> that's the fun thing about like uh, starting a company is that, you know, you think, all right, I solved this problem you know, and we're good. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you're re- we always joke that your reward for solving a problem is more problems, yeah, more. you know? So then you start, you have to fall in love with that, with that process and uh, continue, you know, just to continue to, you know, and you push through. So, so yeah, we we're very fortunate and very grateful for where we're at. Um, but still, yeah, I think, so I think you, just uh, with the potential fair bit to go. Yeah. And you as VP of technology, are you, you're solving mostly technological problems, right? You're not necessarily focused on the business market and those challenges, which exist, right? But you're mm-hmm. actually trying to make better technology happen. Um, tell us about that. Like what is, what is your, your problems that you're currently trying to address? Yeah, it's the, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, definitely try to be more focused on the technology side, the innovation side, and, um, you know, still have to wear the founder hat, you know, in regards to some of the you know, business direction, executive decisions, things like that. Um, but mainly, yeah, what we're looking into now is, so we obviously, for us, we consider our products new produce categories. So we're always talking about, okay, what's the next produce category we want to work on gotcha. to then release to the market? You know, for example, like we have avocados, apples, uh, limes, you know, citrus, and a couple of others. But there's a, there's a number of other categories that this technology can work on. So my team does a lot of product development efforts to then figure, okay, what's the next category? Um, and then, so we, we would call that a new product introduction. The other big thing uh, mentioned maybe a little bit earlier is this idea of quality, like really trying to come up with a objective or coming up with objective measurements for produce quality and detect. So basically how can we use, you know, imaging um, or other advanced imaging techniques, you know, be it hyperspectral imaging um, or even just using spectroscopy itself to give us more inference on the quality of a piece of produce, right? Because right now it's, it's Is this really like hard a different product altogether? Is this something you could yeah. sell at the stores? Because yeah. right now you go to a grocery so. store and there's like a little tart, a card and it's like, turn the melon over and smell the bottom side. And if it's, you know, <laughs> such and such smell, maybe it's yeah. right. But like, I feel like it's a lot of, you know, guess and check. I'm not really sure if there's like a good rigorous way to test this. I would totally buy fruit if I could be sure that it was ripe. I hate buying yeah, a really exactly. apple and I hate buying something that's not ripe yet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and I, I think there's just a ton of opportunity in that field. So, you know, the idea wasn't necessarily, I would say to develop an edible coating that prolongs the shelf life for produce. It was to, it was to help fight food waste. Yeah. And we think there's other ways to do that as well. In addition to this, this coating, and this idea of being able to use these analytical techniques, um, you know, non-destructive analytical techniques or imaging, what have you, to then give more inference into both the detection of certain defects or other other qualities, right? So um, can we sort, um, you know, oranges in a different way or lemons based on acidity, you know, or, you know, based on bricks or sugar amounts, right? So... Um, with all these cool new technologies and the fact they can go really high throughput, particularly the NIR spectroscopy, it really allows you to, you know, look inside, um, the produce and then give you more inference. Yeah, exactly. Into, 
you know, everything's a bell curve, right? So, um, so you need to pick a tree, you could pick, um, a single tree and, you know, take, take every lemon off that tree. And there's going to be a distribution just in regards to some are hardier, stronger than others, some better quality, worse quality. And, you know, I think the industry does a pretty good job of how they sort and segment things now. But, um, I think, I think there's a, this is just a really big opportunity to make that even more, like you said, more refined where it's like, all right, if you can tell me specifically like how long this is going to last and, and what the benefits are, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be more inclined per, to, per, to purchase this. Right. Or I might buy an extra avocado. Now I, you know, I might be a little bit um, hesitant to buy four avocados. I don't think I'll get to it, you know, by the time I go to the store next. And so now I'm, I might be more confident because I know, you know, I'm getting some type of guarantee or some type of yeah. you know, product out there is, is helping with that. Well, I think your consumer already does this, right? Think of avocado is a great example, right? If you're going to make that guac today, you're going to buy a couple soft ones. But if you're right. thinking down the line like, oh, but I also want to do something later on, you're going to get a couple hard ones. If you could just make that process more quantitative, like people exactly. use it because we already do it. We just don't have better tools. And so if you can make those tools, what a cool opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's, so in addition to, it's going to, I think you're going to reduce food waste because you'll get, you know, just more consumers that know like, hey, this is the best buy. This is like a real best buy date right um for this piece of produce this is when you should really have this buy um should drive it should really drive the right consumer behavior um but then in addition if you think from a retailer perspective they could then really figure out how to inventory more properly right they could they should know when i could put these i should put these ones out today this set of avocados out today versus this set because you know this is you know this is predicted to be you know whatever ripe and ready um, you know, tomorrow versus this other one, which I might have two or three days. Right. So then gotcha. you can reduce, you reduce the waste that happens at a retailer, which is, which is also, you know, there's a lot of more articles and things on that now, a lot more data of like, you know, retail waste and a lot of, um, a lot of feedback and a lot of initiatives there. So. Yeah, for sure. And have you found that, uh, fruit spoilage is more predictable with your coating on it or does it introduce more variance? We, we found that actually reduces the variance. So I think what it does, like, again, this idea of a bell curve, it, it'll take the ones that are at the ends and, and sort of bring it in more. So it, it makes the distribution actually more, you know, more normal or more, you know, less. Higher arrival less modulus, wide. just say it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to like really doing <laughs> interviews with, with too many scientists. So yeah, I guess I, I can, I can say that. So Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's cool. That's exactly that's exactly what it. So we we've shown that yeah, it actually does, has this effect as well. Where I think it's taken the the one the fruit that's already super high quality. It, you know, it's already really high quality. But the the stuff that's you know maybe a little bit more suspect, it helps really narrow that in. So tell yeah. me, I mean, how do you guys protect this technology? Is this a trade secret? Is it patent? Is it a little bit of both? What do you do? Because I imagine there's got to be fast followers realizing, holy smokes, there's this is a huge need, and so there's a huge market. Right. No, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great question. It's been one of the cooler things I've also got, you get, I, I've gotten to learn by, you know, starting the company is yeah, this idea of intellectual property and how you approach it. It's such a interesting world that we've built. Um, and so the strategy in which, yeah, you decide, do I want to patent this? Do I want to keep this a trade secret is always the, it's, it's always really the, the, the challenging question. And unfortunately we've had, we have pretty good counsel very early on. And so we have a, we have a pretty strong mix of, you know, we patent a lot of things that we would call our core technologies or, you know, keystone technologies, what have you. Um, and we know that if someone were to infringe on that, we could, we could prove that. Right. But there's some things that we know it might be a little bit more challenging to, to actually prove that someone was yep. infringing on that and on those claims or intellectual property. So, so why tell them case, how to do it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So why tell, exactly. So why tell them how to, how to do that? So, so that's the real, it's the real fun balance of, um, you know, kind of being put in that type of managerial leadership position, what have you is, is making those type of decisions. And, and there's always gray area in regards to like, well, is this really, should we like, you know, should we patent this? Should we not patent this? Like, uh, you know, it's always a, cause it's, 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 it's costly. Right. And understandably so. Especially, but yeah, are you, I assume you're global as well, right? You're not just patenting in the U S yeah, exactly. So yeah, we patent around the world cause that's the foods, you know, that's again, this is, really I think expensive. where, I think, yeah, exactly. And this is where also in addition to not realizing that there wasn't going to be a tool that just told us like bad or good, you know, in regards to, you know, or the coding's doing great, um, that we had to make those up just learning about the global nature of the food system. Right. So the fact that, 
you're probably, you know, in the U S you're probably getting blueberries from like, you know, Chile now, you know, like it, it's just, and things that you just don't even realize. Sometimes you might see it in the package and you're, but you, no one really does that. Right. And so because of this international nature of the food system, yeah, you have to really consider, yeah, where do I file, you know, China, Japan, do I do Chile, Peru, Mexico, and you could, you know, so you have to come up with your strategy because it can get really expensive and really take up a lot of time. So yeah, that, that was a, yeah, coming up with your IP strategy is like one of those things that super important, especially for young technology companies really to get some counsel on that and at least have an initial way of how you want to approach it and then evolve as necessary. So tell me about management. Like you, obviously you guys were a bunch of, you know, grads and you were pretty technically proficient, but as the company grew, yeah. you're doing less of the experiments yourself and you're managing people. Has that been a hard skill to learn? Cause I, I think of me and that's been like a huge learning curve. I was a great researcher yeah. and now, I, now I don't research. I run a research group and that's been hard to learn. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's no book for it. Right. You kind of I think most people just like in your case, probably mimic what, yeah. you know, what your advisor did or what other advisor or people you've seen around you. So yeah, for me, it was really, um, it was, it's been a really fun ride. I mean, I, I originally was my, my initial original intention was to be a professor. So I was going to go do a postdoc and, um, you know, go be, go profess somewhere, but, um, we've got an know, opening to I, change your mind right sure. now. <laughs> Utah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but then, you know, this idea came up and got some traction and really wanted to jump at it. And so, you know, the, the big thing for me yeah, with learning the management aspect of it was, yeah, first starting in the lab, chain to the hood, basically, like nonstop, just working, trying to come up again with this proof of concept because we started with nothing uh, and had nothing, right? We had to really develop a whole lab, which I think as a professor, you probably, you go through that experience too. You have to get your equipment, you have to recruit students it's like us trying to recruit employees like so for me yeah it's you know i don't know how to describe it it was it, it's been super reward rewarding i would say one of the hardest things though going from being a like a, a technical person running experiments all the time to more doing the management was that i think when you when you run experiments daily or what have you you get you get these like little wins you know you, i mean you certainly get yeah there's ups and downs, but you get like, oh, it's an awesome spectra. It's great fit, you know, what have you. Um, but when you, when you manage, you know, you sometimes you'll make a decision and or run an experiment in a, in a way, and you might not know the, if that was the right thing to do or the output, it could be days, it could be months, it could be years. You know, you might make a managerial decision to put this resource here or to order this piece of equipment and do that. And, you know, you, you do it with as you know, best judgment you can is, you know, try to be as quantitative as you can, but ultimately, you know, sometimes it comes down to intuition and, yep. and gut, you know, so it, yeah, it's, it's, um, I would say that was the more challenging part of it. It's like that getting comfortable with that cycle. Um, but you know, for me, it's always like, my style is pretty like hands off, you know, just, you know, just really, if you hire really smart people, the best thing you can do is like get out of their way yep. and just really give them the resources and the time and, uh, yeah, what, what they need to be successful. Cause most scientists is like, they want, you know, let, let them, let them have, <laughs> they want the white space to work with. Um, you know, they don't want to necessarily be told exactly what to do. They want to have some intellectual freedom and, and you know, creativity that, that goes towards it. And they really want the best new equipment, right? Like nobody, you know, everyone wants the latest and greatest. So just try our best to stock up the, the labs with the latest and greatest. And, you know, we're fortunate cause we're close to UCSB as well. So, you know, the team has access to a lot of the equipment there um, if they want to use it. So, yeah. So, you know, I think probably a similar, um, yeah, similar growth, growing grow pains, I call them. Like, yeah. Uh, that I think any manager would have in any, any type of um, profession, you know, be a professor, I think. Yeah. Definitely similar. So cool. Well, I've got a question. You know, I mean, we really, I feel as a field, as material science as a field, has like surrendered food science to chemical engineering, right? Right. And yeah. uh, that's too bad. But my question for you is, as somebody who's been successful in this area, what's missing in our curriculum, in the way that we train our students, in in your background? What do you wish you would have known that would have made you more successful to get into this area? Wow, oh, man, that's a great, that's a really good question. Because I definitely think from the material science, I mean, I'm a homer for material science. Like that's, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. Like, um, so I think the, the background and the coursework, super helpful, you know, building the fundamentals of, you know, obviously looking at material systems and understanding like the trade-offs, like the Ashby plots and all that other yeah. fun stuff. But like, as far as thinking what would have been more useful, yeah, it's a really, yeah, it's a really great question. 
the only thing I could think of is probably, I think more industrial, uh, maybe more industrial, like maybe professors that have a little bit more industry experience or guest lectures and like really hearing their stories of how, um, you know, how things work from a academic research lab and how that then transfers to a industrial lab and how that scales, you know, some of the constraints and things that you have to think about, you know, I would say didn't get too much of that, which I understand in the PhD, because, you know, you're typically, you know, that that's, that's the time to really go deep on something. But I would say in the undergrad, uh, undergrad level, that probably would have been a little bit more helpful. But no, it's a really, it's a, it's a good question, because I think overall, like the, the discipline's awesome because it's very broad and, and you know gives you all this like the thermodynamic fundamentals and structural stuff and, and what have you but yeah as far as thinking about outside fields um i think a little bit more of a focus on that somehow would be would be useful be it via guest lectures or, or courses you know that yeah. you know that, that that at least talk about how to approach it or people that have lived it i think would have been pretty cool but yeah For sure Well, Lou, this was a pleasure, man. Thank you for meeting with us. We sure appreciate it. And I no, got to say, 15 years ago, you and I remember you and Chris showed up from Florida, and I remember being just intimidated because you guys were smart dudes. And it's no fun way. to see that 15 years later, you're still impressing, still doing really no. cool stuff, man. It was great to catch up with you guys. Yeah, definitely if I make it out to uh, Utah. It's like Salt Lake City. Is that where Yeah, come ski, Utah man. Is? Come ski. Come, come ski. to our canyons. Never, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. So yeah, it'd be definitely, it'd be great to catch up. And, and likewise, if you guys are around here, I'd love to show you around appeal, um, you know, give, give you a lab tour and show you what we're up to. Um, so. Okay. Sounds good, man. Okay. This show, as you know, is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, including matmatch.com. Now, you know, you've heard us go on and on. We are big fans of this platform. Let this be the year 2022 where you actually check it out if you haven't yet. It's awesome. If you're a vendor and you want to get your products into the hands of engineers, consider listing your stuff on matmatch.com. Or if you're an engineer and you just want to find that right material, you know, what exactly alloy grade are you looking for and who can sell it to you? Check out matmatch.com and you can find it there. I'll be teaching a materials informatics class this spring. And I'm actually going to have my students come and check this out as a resource for materials data where they can pull the data from the spec sheets from these providers, which will be kind of a fun exercise. And as always, our show is sponsored by the Materials Today journal from Elsevier. Uh, they have a lot of really great articles, especially a lot of new articles on different biomaterials that are helping to solve a lot of our challenges. So definitely check them out. Uh, you can find all of their conferences at materialstoday.com. You can also find them on elsevier.com. If you have questions or feedback, please send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and now YouTube, or wherever you find your podcasts. And if you like the show and want to help us reach more people, consider leaving a review. It helps us improve and exposes new people to the show. And it puts a huge smile on my face. It makes me so happy to read your reviews. Thank you guys out there who are helping us grow this channel. Finally, you can also check out our Instagram page at materialism.podcast and to connect with us and let us know what new material you'd like to hear about next. Uh, we'd also like to give a shout out to Alphabot and Colabyte for making the music for our show. You can check them out on Spotify and YouTube. Catch you next time. See ya.